Amen. This has been called, the Sermon on the Mount has been called the Constitution of the Kingdom. It's been called the Christian's Manifesto. It's been called various things. It shows the characteristics of those who would be disciples of Christ. It also shows the uh, characteristics of those who are striving to live for the Lord and those who are not pleasing to God. There are some things in there that shows the, the uh, attitude of those who do not please God. And so we're going to see some wonderful things in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 concerning uh, the Christian behavior. And Matthew 5, 6, and 7 most definitely has application uh, primarily to the disciples of Christ, but it has secondary application to the world as well, especially when it deals with divorce and remarriage, uh, when we get to that in chapter 5 and verse 32. The reason why I said that is because there is a, an author that wrote a book that lives not far from here, that preaches not far from here. His name is John Hobbes. He's written many books, and in one of his books, he writes um, about Jesus' teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and he says it only applies to disciples. It does not apply to the world. And he says, actually, in the chapter, in one of his books, where he has this false teaching, he says that... Uh, what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount doesn't apply to the world at all. It only applies to Christians, disciples of Christ. Well, it's going to be interesting to, to try to understand when Jesus said, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, or is he going to, to say that people of the world can't lust? And that's not a sin for a person of the world to lust? I tried to contact him and talk about this, but he... He would not return my phone calls and sent a letter telling me that he's heard of me and that I got a beam in my eye and, you know, I'm a bad guy for even questioning, you know. Some of the people that left here years ago are now over there with him and see no problem with his teaching. And these were people who were thought of as very strong conservative members and they're blinded by his false teaching. But the Sermon on the Mount most definitely applies to everyone, but primarily it applies to the disciples who are willing to submit their life to Christ. In chapter 5 and verse 1 it says, Seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he had seated his disciples, came to him. Seated, he was seated, his disciples came to him. This was a common way that the rabbis would teach. We do it in the western civilization where a preacher stands and preaches but a, a rabbi would usually sit and teach and preach in that culture being up in a mountainous area would be a, a natural area for his voice to be heard in the multitudes an amphitheater so to speak effect with the, the mountains surrounding the, the multitudes and you have here beginning in verses 2 through 12, you have the Beatitudes. And these are the blessings that are bestowed upon the attitudes of the disciples. Those who would be followers of Jesus. And he's saying these qualities have to be there in place for you to be a follower of mine, Jesus is saying. A phrase that you're going to find throughout the, the Sermon on the Mount is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. That we know is referring to the church because of Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19. The church and the kingdom of heaven are phrases used interchangeably. So he's talking about behavior of his disciples. His disciples are Christians. They're in the church, the kingdom. These are the qualities that we are to have, the mindset that we are to have. And he pronounces, it, pronounces a blessedness on that. To be blessed, or blessed, as it is sometimes pronounced, means to be in God's favor 
with God's favor being bestowed upon an individual. It means spiritual riches. It means a person is in a right relationship with God. And the way he uses blessed here is very similar to what you find in the Old Testament. Like Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, stand in the way of sinners, or seated in the, in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law he meditates day and night. Blessed. Psalms starts out with that word blessed. That means spiritually favored. So the spiritually favored here, as he talks about it in verse 3, 4, through verse uh, 11, are those who have these qualities that we're going to look at this morning. He opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So he starts off here uh, by talking about the blessed person. And he pronounces a blessing upon these qualities, these characteristics within the people who were going to be his disciples. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. He didn't say the poor. The poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it's very fitting for him to talk about being poor in spirit, starting off. Right off at the very beginning. Now, poor in spirit, what would you suppose that is referring to? Well, I, I wouldn't say it would refer to someone not knowledgeable of the Word of God. Poor in spirit. Deplete, completely dependent upon God. A, a humble attitude. A poor in spirit. It is someone that is in contrast with someone who... Uh, is uh, considered completely full or wealthy, spiritually speaking, and has no room for God. You're not talking about the physically poor. There's nothing inherently be right about a person being physically poor. There's nothing inherently right about a physically poor person. There are good poor people and there are bad poor people. It's like there are good rich people and there are bad rich people talking about physically speaking the poor in spirit is talking about a humble opinion of oneself it is realizing that uh, they that you're a sinner in need of salvation the poor in spirit and it's very interesting he's using a contrast here spiritually rich are the spiritually poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven this is an attitude that depends upon God. The word for poor there is the word in Greek for completely destitute. It's the word that's used in Luke chapter 16 to describe Lazarus, the poor beggar at the rich man's gate. There was another Greek word for poor, and it meant uh, someone that has just enough to get by. That's not the word that's being used here. The word here for poor means spiritually destitute. And this is a person that realizes they are completely dependent upon God for everything, including salvation.
Romans 12 and verse 3. Romans. Yes, for uh, Romans 12 and verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So you don't think too highly of yourself. You need to realize uh, your dependence on God. It's the opposite of pride. It's the opposite of pride and boasting. Look at uh, Isaiah 57 and verse 15. Isaiah 57 and verse 15. God looks favorably upon this attitude. Isaiah 57 and verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. That's exactly what Jesus is referring to. It is the one who has a contrite and humble spirit. He revives the spirit of the humble. Look at Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, verse 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? Verse 2. For all those things my hands has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and one who trembles at my word. There's the attitude he's talking about. Trembling at the word of God. An awesome reverence for God's word. Respecting his authority. And so that's the poor in spirit theirs is the kingdom of heaven you have to have that attitude to even become a Christian you have to have a humble attitude to say I I have done wrong I need to be made right the only way I can be made right is in Christ I need a savior I can't I can't fix the sin problem that I have I have to go to Christ on his terms repentance is a humbling thing And even baptism is a humbling thing. It's very humbling. So it's the poor in spirit. Look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5. 1 Peter 5 and verse 5. Peter says, Likewise, you younger people submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. And be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. That's what Jesus is talking about here, the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You can't get into the kingdom of heaven without this attitude. So it's that humbleness that we are to have. And Jesus illustrates it beautifully in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9. Two people went to the temple to pray. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. That's the very opposite of being poor in spirit. That's the haughty, prideful attitude. Verse 10, Luke 18 and verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even uh, this tax collector. I twice fast a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat on his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, 
but he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about. The Pharisee was bragging to God about how fortunate God was to have him on God's side. You're just so fortunate to have me. I'm not like these people. I'm not like this guy over here. You know, if we're not careful, we can develop that attitude. We see the corruption around us, and we, we, we look at the wickedness around us, and we see, and we get, develop the attitude. I'm glad I'm not like. But see, we were just as lost as they are, going to the same hell that they were, that they are going to. So we don't need to develop any kind of haughty, high-minded holier than thou attitude we are to be holy but remember it's by the grace of god that we are holy not because he looked at us and said well you're just so good you're you're my people no we were just as bad as those people that we hear about on the news just their sins are high profile we have to understand that we are in the same boat as they are in need of a savior and so it's that humble attitude. It's the, the attitude of humility that the, the church at Laodicea had in Revelation 3, verses 17 through 19. They were physically poor, but Jesus said, you're rich. You're rich. They're blessed. So being poor in spirit, you've got to have that attitude in place. Humility. Humility which says, Lord, I'll do whatever you say. I'll obey whatever command you want. I will do whatever you want me to do. And I know I need you because of my sin. That's humility. That has to be in place at the very beginning, and it has to be a characteristic of our mind and our heart all the days of our life, poor in spirit. God will lavishly bless us with riches, spiritually speaking, if we do that. Now, the second beatitude goes along with this. Verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What's the mourning about here? For sin. It's not just someone who mourns. It's not referring to someone who just simply mourns. They're sad. Some people mourn and are sad because they can't do evil things. It's not talking about that. It's talking about your mourning over sin. The reason why I know that is because 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 9 and 10, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Mourning. We've got to be sorry for our sins. So that you have the humble attitude, poor in spirit. Then you have sorrow for sin. You've got to be sorry for what you've done. You've got to be like those on the day of Pentecost when they were cut to the heart. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What do we do? We're, we're guilty. What do we do? And then Peter gave them the plan of salvation. That's mourning for sin. That's a realization that you are spiritually in poverty, poor in spirit, because of your sin. I got myself into that situation through sin. It's nobody's fault but mine. And I've got to be sorry for what I have done. What does James say in James chapter 4? Verse 7, or verse 8 and 9. He says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. 
Yet your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself, verse 10, in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. I've talked to people sometimes uh, about their sin, about what they're doing, and they'll laugh. And I'll tell them, so one day you won't be laughing. One day it won't be funny. And hopefully it's in this life when that laughter turns to mourning, when that laughter turns to sorrow and they become a Christian. Or they'll have to face an eternity of misery and mourning. One day, they won't laugh. It's not going to be funny anymore. Either way, there has to be sorrow. So it's the the attitude of sorrow, the attitude uh, that recognizes sin. You find this attitude in David, Psalm 51, when he humbles himself before God, recognizing he has sinned, that he has violated the will of God, and he, he wants to be made right with God. And he's writing this psalm as a psalm of repentance, asking for forgiveness. So there's poor in spirit. That person is blessed. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That person who mourns over their sin, they will be comforted. When does the comfort come? After repentance, because what has happened? Forgiveness. What do you read about in the book of Acts after a person is baptized? Rejoicing. Rejoicing. Then the feelings of joy, the feelings are there as a result of having obeyed. So we have to be sorry before we get happy. But people in our society don't want that. They want to go to church and be happy. The only feeling they want is happy. They don't want the feeling of guilt. They don't want to be told they're wrong. They don't want their their sin to be pointed out. They don't want to feel guilty. They want to feel happy. But biblically speaking, you don't get happy till you get sorry first. You got to be sorry. Then you bring happiness, which will bring in heaven ultimate happiness. But you got to be sorry first. Yes. Exactly. It's, it's, people, people will actually say they don't want to go somewhere and make them feel guilty. And there's one church that had a motto for a while. I don't know if it still has that motto that says life is not a guilt trip. They don't want to feel guilty. They don't, they don't want guilt. But you've you got to feel guilty before you have the rejoicing of forgiveness and then ultimate happiness. People say... God wants me to be happy in you know, whatever situation they're in, whether it's an unscriptural marriage or whether it's, you know, some kind of perverted relationship. God wants me to be happy. No, He doesn't. He wants you to be faithful, which leads to sorrow for sin, which brings about ultimate happiness. People that bought into this, God, this concept, God... God wants me to be happy. Where's that in the Bible? That's not in the Bible. Right. Right. Have sorrow. So the, this, this false concept of uh, you've got to be happy, you've got to be not feeling guilty, and, and it's just of the devil. It's not of the Lord because he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And that godly sorrow leads to repentance. Now verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek refers to what? Control. Self-control. Power under control. That's what the word means in the original language. Meek. 
people mistakenly think it means weak. Because, it, I don't know, because it rhymes? Or they just think it does. But it does not mean weak. It means power under control. Meekness, that word for meek, that word in the original language, in the original Greek, was used to describe a wild stallion that was broken and could be ridden on now by a child. The horse is meek now. Has the horse lost its power? No. But now it's under control. It's under control. Numbers chapter 12 talks about Moses being the meekest man on earth. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. One through three. It says then Miriam and Aaron, verse one, Numbers twelve, verse one, spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So Miriam he had trouble in his family. How many people had trouble in their family? <laughs> Moses did. Jesus did. He married an Ethiopian. Verse two. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. You see, when people gripe and they sow discord, God hears it. People will be held accountable for it. Verse 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Some translations say meek. It's the same concept. Now, when you read about Moses, do you get the impression he was weak? No. He was tough. He was a tough individual even into his old age. At 120 when he died, his eyesight was still good. His life force, his vigor was still there. He was a tough individual. Then you look at Jesus, the ultimate in meekness, the ultimate in humility, Philippians chapter 2. He humbled himself. He went from God to humanity without giving up his deity. He humbled himself to become a, a baby growing in Mary's womb, to be a baby that needed to be fed and needed his diaper changed, to a child growing up. The God of the universe humbled himself to do that. And when you look at the life of Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you don't get the impression that he was a weak individual. Very strong, very bold, gentle, gentle towards those who would be willing to come to him, but bold and very straightforward to those who opposed the truth. Right. Exactly. He had, he had the power of miracles but did not uh, do it. He resisted the devil with the scripture, the power of God's word. And Jesus, all throughout his ministry, gave credit to the Father. I'm here to do the Father's will. He didn't come to glorify himself. I'm here to do the Father's will. Must, exactly. He had to be about his Father's business. So that humble attitude that he had it refers to uh, those who are meek they shall inherit the earth now some have interpreted this to refer to the blessings that are here upon the earth Uh, we seek first the kingdom Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 all the necessities of life that are met here upon the earth will be given to us so we inherit the earth in that sense we put the kingdom first Uh, We, uh, as people of God, are able to enjoy the things of the earth more so than anyone else. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 19 through chapter 6 and verse 2. And there is a new heaven and a new earth in the spiritual realm that the children of God will inherit. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13 speaks of the destruction of this world and the physical heavens and a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwell. 
a spiritual realm. So the inheriting of the earth is something that we in, enjoy now as the, the people of God. And we realize where all this came from. You know, when we look around as the children of God, we know who made it. And we know because of Christ, we're in a relationship with the one who made it. And we enjoy this world more so than those who look around and, and see evolution or they see uh, uh, the just natural law. They have, they have no purpose of life. They have no uh, reason to even go on. I mean, because they don't believe in an afterlife. Uh, so we enjoy the things of this life and the beauty of this world more than anyone else on the earth. So there's a poverty of spirit. There is being sorry for sin. There is being that, having that meekness, which is uh, self-control. It goes along with the whole concept of humility. Galatians chapter 5 talks about one of the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Meekness. Then it talks about those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I believe this is beautifully illustrated in Psalm 42. Psalm chapter 42, verses uh, 1 and 2. The sons of Korah. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O Lord. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So you have that attitude of longing to be with God. Longing to want to know God. Longing to want to know more of His Word. Wanting to study. Wanting to know it more. Hungering and thirsting after God's Word. It's the attitude you find in the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. They search the Scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. We should be known as daily searchers of the Scriptures. Daily studiers of God's Word. We're to desire it like newborn babes desire the mother's milk. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. That desire for food. We should have the same appetite for the Word of God that we do for food every day. You ever see someone that eats every day? Well, I eat every day. I don't know. Do y'all eat every day? Because we got a desire in us to eat every day. You ever see someone criticize you for eating? Didn't you just eat this morning? What are you eating again? It's lunch. We're here at supper time about six. You're going to eat again? Well, shouldn't we study the Bible like that? Every day. Take time. We're going to feed our bodies... We should feed our soul every day. There are many people who don't pick up the Bible until Sunday. They're starving all week long, spiritually speaking. And they'll be weak Christians. We should hunger and thirst for righteousness every day. Now, that not only means a study of God's Word, but righteousness, doing what's right. You know, when you become a Christian and the Word of God becomes a part of your thinking process, you evaluate everything in the light of righteousness. It will affect everything that you do. You go watch a movie, it's going to affect how you watch a movie. It will affect the choices you make in the movies that you watch. It will affect the entertainment that you watch on television. It will affect the... uh, the things you engage in as far as entertainment is concerned. 
Because you're not only hungering and thirsting for the information of righteousness, you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, being right. You want to do what's right in every single situation. And that's, that's uh, something that we learn from the Word of God. How does this applicable? How does this apply to everything in our life? So that hunger and thirst for righteousness means you, it's carried out also in our life. We feed on the Word of God so we'll know how to live, on, live out God's will in our life. We're not just studying for the sake of information. We're studying for the sake of living out righteously before God. By the way, uh, the concept of righteousness is one of the key words in the book of Romans that we're going to be studying on Wednesday night. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. How God makes people right with himself through his will. So we have to have that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Again, that Go, that ties in with the previous things. That means without the Word of God, we're spiritually starving. And we know it. And we know it. So that poverty of spirit, destitute of spiritual food, destitute of, of what we need to sustain us, is what we are uh, hungering and thirsting for. You know, it's exactly what Jesus spoke of uh, when he was tempted. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, verse 3 and 4. He was fasting, you know, and it's, the tempter came and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If you want to truly live, live as God would have His creatures live, as Christians, you'd live not only on physical food, but also on spiritual food, on every word of God. So we should hunger and thirst for righteousness as our bodies a hunger and thirst for physical food and physical drink. We probably have a little bit of time for verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they obtain shall obtain mercy. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is God withholding the punishment and the wrath that we do deserve. And we need to be merciful people towards those who are around us. Jesus demonstrated mercy toward those who were around him. Luke 23 and verse 34. uh, He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And Stephen also in Acts 7 and verse 60 said, Lay not this sin to their charge when they were stoning him to death. He was extending mercy to them. He wanted them to be saved. Just as Jesus on the cross wanted the ones that were inflicting pain upon him to be saved. That's extending mercy. Later on in the, in the model prayer, he's going to talk about uh, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12. We have to be merciful to people, and Jesus talks about the unforgiving servant that did not show mercy on his fellow servants, Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. We have to be willing to show mercy and forgive those who repent. And repentance is a part of the equation. Luke chapter 17 and verse 3. Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. We cannot dispense unconditional forgiveness. There's repentance involved. P. 
people leave that out of the equation. But those are the instructions of Christ. So we need to be merciful people because we are the recipients of God's mercy. We are the recipients of God's mercy and therefore we need to be forgiving uh, to other people as well. And Jesus made it very plain there in Matthew chapter 18 when he did talk about the, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Matthew chapter 28, excuse me, Matthew 18, Matthew 18, Verse 35, he says, So my heavenly Father also will do to you, talking about punishment, if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Holding a grudge is the opposite of showing mercy. Holding a grudge is when repentance has taken place and the asking of forgiveness has taken place and you still won't forgive. We have to be merciful and forgive just as God has forgiven us in Christ. Right. That's, that's exactly right. That's part of our mercy because uh, we're not to do that. Even though we have the choice to do that and that choice would be wrong... We could do it in an action or, or in our words. It would, be, it would violate the scripture, but we don't because we know God will handle it. And that's just what we have to have that attitude of God will handle it. Right. Exactly. Romans 12, where it talks about that. We need to let God take care of the situation. And God usually does, even in this life. I've seen some things happen that I, again, going back to providence, I can't explain, but it comes upon people that have done others wrong. I can't explain it. And I just, it makes me wonder. Yeah. The world calls it, calls it karma, and that comes from Hinduism and Buddhism, but it's called reaping what you sow in the Bible, you know. So continue reading uh, Matthew chapter 5 for next week. Read all of that chapter. There's 48 verses in Matthew 5. And we'll go deeper into the Beatitudes and deeper into the lessons found in the teachings of Christ.